All right, good evening and welcome to Bibliology 101, Bibliology and Bible Overview, BI 101, excuse me, uh, taught by the New Covenant College here at the Institute of the New Testament Baptist Church in Dover, Tennessee. We're all the way to week number 10, week number 10. Uh, this is a two-hour course, 20 lectures, so this would be our halfway point lecture-wise. So we are encouraged that we've made it this far, and we are now concluding the section of the class dealing with bibliology. We have made it all the way to the very end of this portion of the course. We began there uh, back with biblical epistemology and the inspiration of the Scriptures, the infallibility of the Scriptures, then the preservation of the Scriptures. In the last several weeks, we've, we've looked at uh, various false views of preservation. And tonight, we want to consider, as a final lesson, the class that uh, many have been waiting for, and that is the class on the King James Version of the English Bible. And we want to consider the King James Version in light of what we already have learned. Uh, some have mistakenly thought that this entire class is all about the King James Version of the Bible. Uh, folk have asked me what we're teaching and what we're laboring in, and I'll tell them, oh, it's a bibliology class. And they'll say, oh, is it a, just about the King James Bible? <laughs> Not at all. Um, for those of you who have attended all of your BI 101 lectures, You'll know that uh, up until now, the King James has not been a focal point of any one particular lesson. Uh, rather, what we've done is we've tried to root the doctrine of bibliology firmly in the teaching of Scripture, and we've consistently followed the logic of faith. That is, we've looked at what Scripture teaches, and we've made sure that all of our conclusions in bibliology have been consistent with the teachings of Scripture and we've had a strict adherence to the doctrine of providential preservation. Providential preservation. This has led us, as you can find in the last uh, several lectures, to hold to the received text uh, as the perfectly preserved New Testament. The received text. And we saw the, the history of the metacanon and the microcanon and what the received text is and then some uh, challenges to the received text. Uh, and uh, we, we looked at the received text in light of modern textual criticism and also in light of what is commonly referred to as Ruckmanism. Uh, and we want to conclude now with a positive lesson here on the King James Version of the Bible. Um, critics of the TR camp will seek to uh, label the TR position as just another variety of King James onlyism or KJVO. And we dealt with the faulty views, the, the radical views of King James onlyism when we looked at Ruckmanism in the last lecture. And you need to understand that the TR position or the, the received text view of preservation is very distinct from those teachings. It is a teaching that is based on the perpetual manifestation of the scriptures and the idea that God's people have always had the word of God. So as we come into translation, as we come into modern Bible versions that we have in our hands today, uh, we need to see those in light of what God has been doing for the last 2,000 years in preserving his word. Uh, so the question then becomes, how does the doctrine of providential preservation and how does the received text lead us to the King James Version? Well, let me ask you this. How did you receive the received text? How did you receive the word of God? Well, most of you watching this, most of you here tonight, well, as a matter of fact, all of you here tonight, I know for a fact none of you received the received text in the Greek language. But you received the Word of God through your native language. For those of you here tonight, you all speak English. For some of our online students, they speak other languages. Uh, but chances are most of you receive the Word of God through a translation. And we confess that God has seen fit to translate His preserved Word into many languages. So, we're not King James only, but we're also not Greek and Hebrew only. Uh, 
We believe that God in His providence has translated His Word into many languages. And there are faithful and accurate translations of God's Word in many languages. So that is how we get to the King James Version of the Bible. Uh, the King James is a translation from the received text. So those of you who have, uh, were introduced to the Word of God, who received the Word of God, who realized that the Word of God is the Word of God through the witness of the Holy Spirit, bearing and working upon your heart, and you did so while reading a King James Version, you received God's Word through the received text as it was translated in the King James Bible. So that's why it's significant uh, to study this particular topic. And what I want to do uh, is give you some reasons for the retention of the King James Version by English speakers. Why should English-speaking Christians today still use and uh, hold to and retain the King James Version of the English Bible? And I want to give you four primary reasons. The first is really more of a, a banner in which several reasons will fall under, but we're just going to call it our first reason. And the first reason uh, in which we should be Retaining the King James Bible, and re retaining simply means not to let go of it, but to keep it, to use it, to hold to it. Uh, the first reason, and like I said, it's really more of a banner, is translational reasons. Translational reasons. Translational reasons. So, the most uh, compelling argument, uh, the most staunch reason why uh, we would hold to the King James Version as being the version that should be used by English speakers is that the King James is the most accurate English translation of the received text. Once you come to a received text position, once you come to a received text position, you will of necessity come to understand the necessity of the King James Version of the English Bible. Uh, the King James is somewhat of a final draft of all of the English TR versions that preceded it. And after the King James, there are only two mainstream English TR versions. So before the King James, you have Bibles like the Tyndale New Testament, uh, the Matthews Bible, the Geneva Bible, the Bishop's Bible, and you have the King James Version. And remember that English revision process. The King James is really the final draft of that English revision process. There were various English Bibles all produced in the 1500s and then early 1600s. And then the King James really was the final draft in that process. And we didn't really see a whole influx of English Bibles until many years later. And all of those early English Bibles came from the TR. And the King James is the supreme translation from the received text of that era. And then after your King James, you have two mainstream versions from the TR, one of those being the New King James Version, and one of those being the MEV. And we don't have time to really delve into the specifics of those Bibles. I would recommend you having one for your own personal use and study. Uh, but it's important to understand that neither of those match the form or the accuracy of the King James. In fact, the New King James at some places even departs from the received text. And so... Um, we would, we would have to understand that if we hold to a position that believes that the Textus Receptus is the inspired and preserved Word of God, then the, the best translation from that in the English language is our authorized King James Version. Uh, so we have to ask the question, well, why is it that the King James is such an accurate translation? Why is the King James such an accurate translation? Well, it's not because the translators were inspired, is it? No, we covered that last time we met together. Uh, we understand that the translators were not divinely inspired the way that the apostles and prophets were as they were writing the originals. So why is it such an accurate translation? Well, I want you to consider the scholarship. Consider the scholarship that worked on the King James translation. There's around 50 men, the different uh, different. Sources will give you different numbers. There's a, a, an original number that began the translation process, and then a few kind of trickled off until you had a more final number. But around 50 men in total were working on the translation of the King James Version from 1604 to 1611. They did this in seven years. Uh, all of these men were proficient in the biblical languages and the classic languages. 
There is a, a language proficiency that is unparalleled today. I have a friend of mine um, who made the, the statement, if we're really going to be fair, if we're going to uh, come up with a translation committee to produce a new Bible, we ought to have the interviews in Latin <laughs> because that was the language proficiency uh, of the men who worked on the translating committee for the King James Version. And so well, one of the prerequisites, he says, should just be, well, let's just have the interview in Latin. And if you can have a Latin interview, uh, then we'll move from there and we'll see what your translation ability is like. But you see, that's the level of scholarship that was working on the King James Version of the Bible. Um, these men were working full time. The, the translation was there. They, they ate, slept, and breathed translation. And, and biblical language and New Testament and Old Testament manuscripts and uh, all of these different things as part of their studies and as part of their work. Many of these men were also fluent in other languages. As I pointed out, uh, one of the gentlemen was fluent in over 20 languages. He could read, write, and speak and hold conversation over 20 different languages. Uh, see, you have to understand that there's one thing to learning languages, but then there's also uh, something called language theory, which is just the formation and development of languages. And we're talking about men that were proficient in these areas, very proficient in these areas. Uh, one man who was working on the King James Version, uh, doing translating work, he had, read, he had read everything that was written in Biblical Greek that was available in 1604. Think about that. Every piece of Greek literature that it was possible for him to read, he had read it. That's remarkable. That is remarkable. Uh, he was obviously a master, a master of the Greek language. And uh, time does not permit me to talk about the meticulous translation process itself, but you have to understand that each passage of the King James Version was cross-examined many, many times many times. So they, they, what they would do is they would divide up into groups and they would have specialists who would work on a particular uh, passage and those specialists would translate their passage but then that passage would be checked by another committee and then everybody would get together and check that, that passage. So at the end of the day, every passage had been checked and checked and triple checked and quadruple checked and checked and checked again. That was the meticulous process through which the King James Bible was translated. And this scholarship is unparalleled by anything before it and anything after it. We've never had anything that has matched that level of scholarship. So consider the scholarship that worked on the translation of the King James Version when we talk about why is it such an accurate translation. Secondly, you need to consider the methodology of the translators. Consider the translating method which they employed. They translated with a formal equivalence, a formal equivalence. Um, that is, they wanted to be as word for word as was possible without losing the meaning of the text. So they wanted to uphold the meaning of the text, but they wanted to translate as word for word, as literalistically as they possibly could. Now, anybody that knows anything about translation, you must readily admit that there's no such thing as a completely word for word translation. That's why you'll find italics in your King James Version, where they had to add in English words uh, to help convey the meaning of the Greek, because uh, a lot of your ancient languages, like Greek, for instance, the word order is irrelevant in a lot of places where it's very relevant in the English. And a lot of times articles and connecting words are absent in the Greek because the declension of the word itself gives you the meaning. Well, in English, we don't necessarily have that, so sometimes you have to add a word in to convey the meaning. For instance, if I were to say, I threw the ball to Adam, there would be no word to in the Greek, and there might not even be a word I. You would just say, through ball Adam, and the way that I decline those words, it would explain to you that I'm the one doing the throwing, and Adam is the one doing the receiving of the ball, right? But in, in English, we don't have verbs and nouns that function that way, so we have to include the, the uh, pronoun I, I, uh, through then the article the ball, right? So I threw the ball to preposition Adam, right? So we have to put these uh, words in there um, to make sure that it's coherent. 
And, uh, the, but the translators wanted to be as, as formally equivalent as possible, meaning that they didn't want to produce a Bible that was just uh, the thoughts of God or a paraphrase of what God said, but they wanted to produce a Bible that was the Word of God. Right? That was their goal, and that is why the King James is such an accurate translation. Now, the King James is not the only Bible to employ this method. Right? You have other Bibles that are formally equivalent, but it's what, what we have to also understand is that uh, you can give a perfect translation, but if you give a perfect translation of a deficient text, you defeat the purpose. So not only did the King James provide a formally equivalent translation, but they did so from the received text. Right, So, uh, when you hear people comparing the King James Version with versions that are translated from the modern critical text that are also formally equivalent, and they'll say, well, New American Standard or King James, it really makes no difference. They're both formally equivalent translations. Uh, yes, they are, but they're formally equivalent translations of totally different underlying manuscripts. Uh, totally different, of course, tongue-in-cheek, uh, being that the critical text has uh, deviations from the received text, so obviously there's a lot of overlap and similarities in those underlying manuscripts, but you see, you see the point that I'm making here. You need to make sure if you're going to do a perfect translation, it needs to come from a perfect underlying text, right? So consider the methodology that the translators employed. As they were handling the, the, the uh, received text, they were not sifting through it, trying to figure out what is and what is not the Word of God. They were not sifting through variants like... Uh, the Kama Yohanium or the Pericope de Adulterae, and wondering, uh, is this really the Word of God? No, they, they weren't concerned with that at all. They were not trying to find the Word of God. They just wanted to faithfully translate the Word of God, and they did. So, consider the methodology. Thirdly, consider the language. Consider the language. Some of the often criticized words in the King James that are labeled as archaic or outdated, uh, are actually very helpful in retaining the original text. And some of those words are actually one of the reasons why the King James still remains one of the most accurate translations of the Bible. Uh, we could look at a number of examples to prove this point, but turn to John chapter 3. Turn to John chapter 3, and I want to uh, use a very common objection. The, let's talk about the these and the thous and the yees and the yous. These personal pronouns. Now, let me give you the code. Now, of course, as you all know, uh, the these and the thous are often criticized as being outdated, and it makes the Bible so hard to understand. Well, let me explain it to you very simply. If it begins with T, it is singular. So if it begins with T, thee, thou, thine, thy, it is singular. We're talking about one person, individual, collective thing. If it begins with a Y, it's plural. Ye, you, your, yours, plural. Okay, keep that in mind. That's all you need to know to be able to understand these pronouns right here. So uh, look at John 3. I want to show you a place where this is very significant, where it helps to explain the meaning of the text before us. Look at John 3 and verse 3. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, see that? So who is he talking to? Well, you all know the story. He's talking to Nicodemus, the ruler of the Jews, right? The ruler of the Pharisees, the teacher. And uh, he says to Nicodemus, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, just you, Nicodemus, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. But drop down to verse number 7. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye, that is, not just you, Nicodemus, but everyone, ye must be born again. Now, is this a cardinal doctrine? Well, no, it's not a cardinal doctrine, whether or not it's singular or plural. Of course, the new birth is absolutely a cardinal doctrine. But whether or not Jesus is talking singular or plural does not make or break a cardinal doctrine, but it nevertheless is a point that God put in the original text when He inspired the gospel according to John that is lost in modern translations when we just use the word you in both verses. But when we keep that personal pronoun differentiating between singular and plural, we preserve this distinction in the text. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. So it's not just, uh, not just Nicodemus, not just the Jews, but it's everyone. 
Jews, Gentiles, everyone must be born again. So that's a, that's a point that we see when we have these differentiating personal pronouns. So consider the language. And there's other places uh, where the same um, point can be proven and made, and we can see that from other examples. But the language is very, very important. Uh, then lastly, under our translational reasons, I want you to consider the Old Testament. Consider the Old Testament. The Old Testament was inspired and preserved in what language? Somebody help me out. Hebrew, Hebrew right? Hebrew. 99.9% uh, .9 anyways, maybe a little Aramaic smattered in there, but uh, was preserved and inspired in Hebrew. So shouldn't translations of the Old Testament come from Hebrew? Doesn't that make sense? Uh, in our confession where we, we read that God, by His singular care and providence, hath kept His word pure in every age, it also says this, the Old Testament in Hebrew, which was the native language of the people of God of old, and the New Testament in Greek, which at that time of writing of it was most generally known to the nations, being immediately inspired, and by his singular care and providence, kept pure in all ages. And we made that point when we looked at the received text that not only were our Baptist ancestors confessing a particular version or a particular text type, but they were also um, confessing a particular form of the text. That is, they did not confess the Latin Vulgate. They confessed the Greek New Testament, the received text. Well, do you notice that they also confessed the Old Testament text as it was written in Hebrew? Yeah, so translations of the Old Testament should come from the Hebrew because that's what God inspired and what God preserved. Well, let me tell you this. The King James Version is the only mainstream English version that is translated in the Old Testament entirely from Hebrew. All of your uh, mainstream, perhaps MEV excluded, are in part or in whole, not, not, not in whole, uh, but at least in part, and I'll explain in a minute, translated from a Greek translation of the Old Testament Hebrew called the Septuagint to one degree or another. The reason why I say it's not wholly translated from the Septuagint is because you have uh, issues within the Septuagint where uh, you couldn't produce an entire Old Testament from uh, just the Septuagint without relying upon the Hebrew there. But... Um, you must understand that the King James translates entirely from the Masoretic text of the Old Testament. And uh, in this course, this bibliology course, we haven't really delved into too much of the Old Testament textual criticism. And that's honestly because in the day and age in which we live, the, the Old Testament is a conversation that is approaching, but it's not quite there yet. Most of the conversation, the bulk of it, still centers around the New Testament text. But the Old Testament's coming. And so we need to already start thinking in these uh, in these areas, and you must understand that the King James is translated entirely from Hebrew. So if you say, I want an a, a tr English translation of the Old Testament entirely from Hebrew, well, you're going to go out and buy a King James version of the Bible. Um, even the New King James, even the New King James, which is almost prim entirely from the, the Hebrew Old Testament, still at some places ref, uh, diverts to the Septuagint here and there. So one of the key issues with this is um, the Ruckmanite will say that the King James Version should be used to correct, quote-unquote, correct the Hebrew and the Greek, right? And um, those who would oppose the received text position, would accuse us of elevating a translation over the original, which we adamantly do not do. I, I would never posit that uh, a translation is supreme to the original. But you understand that the Bibles, that the new, where the New Testament is coming from the modern critical text, they, they have an Old Testament that's coming largely or in part from a Greek translation. And so they're elevating a translation over the original. And they're at points deviating from the original Hebrew and citing with readings found in the Greek translation. So that should be extremely problematic to anyone who believes that God inspired and preserved His Word in the Hebrew language for the use of translation. Right. So we don't believe that the King James corrects originals 
right? And we don't believe that the King James should ideally be used to translate. Now, I understand on the mission field, there have been times when English missionaries have had nothing but the King James Bible, and as they were learning whatever language they were ministering to, they would translate portions from the King James, and, and God is pleased to use that, and I'm thankful for it. But ideally, when we want to uh, sit down and really make a comprehensive translation, we shouldn't be using the King James to do that translation. We should find someone who's proficient in the biblical Greek and Hebrew and make the translation from those languages which God originally inspired. Otherwise, you're going to be playing a big game of biblical telephone, <laughs> and that just never ends up well. Okay, so uh, those are some translational reasons. Consider the, the uh, Old Testament. Consider the methodology. Consider the language. And consider the uh, fact that the King James was translated from the received text. Consider the scholarship that was involved in that translation. Secondly, second reason, those are some translational reasons. Secondly, the historical attestation. Historical attestation of the King James Version. What do I mean by the historical attestation? Well, what I mean is that the King James Version has been around for over 400 years. And for more than three centuries, the King James Version has been the most widely read English Bible by far. Now, it is no longer the number one selling English version, but if you look at the readership of the Bible, the King James is overwhelmingly the most read version of the Bible. This is what I mean by historical attestation. Now, I'm not saying that we should retain the King James simply because we've always used it. That's a silly argument to say, well, it worked for Grandma, so it's good enough for me. No, that's not what I'm saying at all. What I'm saying is this. The historical attestation, being around for 400 years, being the most read Bible in English for 300 years, means that no other translation of Scripture has been analyzed, criticized, scrutinized, and picked through more than the King James Version. There are entire Bible commentaries and entire expositions written from the King James Version by uh, men from all different denominations and backgrounds. This is not a sectarian Bible. You can't say that, oh, well, the Baptists have put their spin on it, or the Presbyterians have put their spin on it, or the Anglicans have put their spin on it. Um, you can't say, well, it was really popular in the 1700s, but not in the 1900s. No, because you can find Bible commentaries written from the King James Version in virtually every century since it has been written since it's been translated. Uh, think of John Gill's exposition of the Bible. John Gill, the particular Baptist there in the 1700s, ministering at the Goat Yard Chapel, he wrote a very comprehensive uh, commentary. I have it sitting at home on my shelf. I have it printed in nine volumes where John Gill exposits every single verse of the King James Version. <laughs> and John Gill was a man who was fluent in multiple languages. Now, was John Gill infallible? No, nor were the King James Version translators. But what I'm saying to you is this. You have men like John Gill and others who have picked through every single verse of the King James Version. What are the likelihoods that you and I will find some big problem, some big corruption or discrepancy that none of those men have ever found? The likelihood of that is practically nil. If someone says, I found this major error in the King James Version that no one has ever seen. That's a mighty bold statement to make of a Bible that has been read by the brightest Christian minds for the last 300 to 400 years. And now you compare that to a modern English version that's only been around 20 or 30 years. See, there's a trustworthiness with the King James Version that's not possessed with any other English version. That's, that's just the fact of the matter. Right. So there's the historical attestation of the King James Version. And again, we're not talking about subjective arguments. We're not talking about, well, Daddy was saved with the King James Version, so that's why we need to keep it. Right. What we're talking about is the fact that it has been around, and in the providence of God it has been used by God and used by His men and preached from and taught from and examined and looked through and scrutinized and written on and exposited and reviewed time and time again again. 
And uh, so far, uh, though some will uh, say that there are places of improvement, or some will even say that there are some errors here and there, but nobody could say that, that this Bible is not an, an excellent and accurate translation of the received text. So that's, that historical attestation there is why it should be retained. Thirdly, the style of the King James Version. Thirdly, the style of the King James. Um, this, uh, some would discredit this as being a, a meaningless argument, but I really think that there's some weight to this argument. The, the King James Version is objectively beautiful. It is objectively beautiful. And the King James, you must understand, was written to be heard, not only read. The King James Version was written uh, with the intention of being read by God's people in the public square and in corporate worship. And the beauty of the prose of the King James is identifiable even to non-Christians. I was reading the other day, there was a, an atheist uh, who said that uh, anyone, any English speaker that has never read the King James Version of the Bible is bordering on barbarism. Uh, that if, you're an if you speak English and you've never read the King James, you're a barbarian because this is such a beautiful masterpiece of literature. And anyone who understands the English language recognizes it as such. And uh, this beauty is also what makes the King James identifiable as a divine writing. As a divine writing. The, the King James translators were not attempting to produce a Bible that was filled with colloquial language. They didn't want a Bible that sounded just like the newspaper. right? Even the, the New Testament as it was written was written in a style that was not exactly a one-to-one -one ratio with the Greek that was spoken in that day. And when the King James was written, the King James Bible was not written in an English that was spoken in that day. Just read some other English literature from 1611. Read the preface to the translators at the front of your King James Bible, if you have an edition that includes that, and you'll find that there is a difference in the way the King James sounds than even the way they spoke in 1611. And why is that? Because they wanted to maintain uh, this beauty, the prose of the King James Version. They wanted this distinct ability about the King James Version. Version. And uh, again, uh, this is not an argument from the underlying text or anything like that, but it is something we should consider. When you open up the King James Version and you begin to read it, you know that that is God's Word. Uh, it is a Bible that speaks for itself because of the beauty of its prose, and that's something that we should, quite frankly, retain and want to retain. This uh, identifiable beauty is also what makes the King James so uniquely recognizable and easy to memorize. Uh, just open up a newspaper and open up the King James and read the same amount of words in each and try to memorize the newspaper and try to memorize the King James. And you're, you'll find that it's going to be a lot easier for you to memorize the Bible. Okay, So we, we want to consider the style. Again, it's, it's not something we would base our entire argument on, but it is something that needs to be considered and thought of. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a wonderful masterpiece, and it would be a shame to just throw it away, to just dis count it and not consider the style of the Bible. And then the fourth and last issue uh, that I want to talk about is the issue of copyrights. The issue of copyrights. Well, in the 21st century, translating Bibles has become big, big business. And all modern versions just about have a copyright that is held by a for-profit publisher. That is, there is a company that holds the copyrights to the Bible, whether it be the ESV being owned by Crossway, uh, NIV being owned by Zondervan, so, so on and so forth. You get what I'm saying? New King James being owned by Nelson. And they own these uh, copyrights and they sell the Bibles for money. Now, I'm not saying that we shouldn't sell Bibles for money. I'm glad that there are stores that sell Bibles. Praise the Lord for that. But what I am saying is this. Because of these copyrights, uh, when these modern versions are revised, you have to understand that in order to obtain a new copyright, the revision must be sufficiently different in order to secure a new copyright. Okay, So if you have a, a 1980 edition and you want to come out with a 1990 edition, 
you can't come out with the same exact edition. You have to come out with a new edition, right? Uh, and in order to do that, you have to have a sufficient amount of changes. I'm not sure what the current percentage is on that, but you need to, it has to be substantially different. You can't just remarket the same book and slap a new copyright on it. Okay, so that is something that we must understand uh, when it comes to uh, the King James Version. The King James Version is in the public domain. And as we observe the various revisions of many of these modern versions, we can see the liberal shift that takes place in the uh, re revising of these modern versions. Oftentimes what will happen is a Bible will debut as conservative and it will become liberal by its second or third uh, generation. Think about the differences in the 1984 MIV as compared with the 2011 NIV. The 1984 MIV came out, NIV, and it, it was uh, supposed to be this pretty conservative translation, a pretty modest translation. Uh, but then the 2011 NIV came out, and everybody was jumping ship, right, because of uh, some of the changes in that, um, in that edition. And this liberal shift in the, the uh, translating of the, of the Bible and the re revising of the Bible is especially seen in the way that culture... Uh, seeps into the text, the way the cultural issues seep into the text. Consider, if you will, uh, the gender-inclusive language in a lot of these modern versions. Uh, turn with me, if you would, to James chapter number 3. James chapter number 3. And while you're turning there, let me tell you about Psalm chapter number 1. Most of you could probably quote Psalm chapter number 1. Blessed is the man, right? Who walketh not in the counsel of ungodly? Blessed is the man, right? Well, what's the truth being taught there? Is that being is it, is the teaching there that only men, only males, uh, are able to uh, be blessed if they walk not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor sit in the seat of the scorners, nor stand in the way? No, that's not what uh, that's teaching. Yes, of course, if a woman obeys that same precept, she'll be blessed as well. But who is that man that did that? Who is that blessed man? Well, it's Christ, is it not? That's the Christology there in Psalm chapter number 1. Well, if you replace, blessed is the man in Psalm chapter number 1, if you replace that with a gender-inclusive pronoun, such as blessed is the person, or blessed is anyone, or blessed is they, you destroy the Christology in the passage. And when the when and this should be a, a simple point of agreement. If the underlying text says he... It should be translated as he. If it's a masculine noun or a masculine pronoun, it should be translated as such. Uh, we don't need the translators to tell us what they think God was saying. Just give us the word of God and, and we can read it. And if, and if we, we can understand through the uh, leading of the Holy Spirit that when Psalm 1 says, Blessed is the man, we understand that there's princeps, principles and precepts that apply to women as well. Right, But we, we want to retain what God said because in what God said, we also have a wonderful teaching of the Christology of that passage. So uh, now James chapter number 3. Look at James 3 and uh, verse number 1 of James 3. The Bible says, My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation, for in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in the word, the same is a perfect man and able to uh, bridle the whole body. Right? What, what is James talking about there in verse number 1 when he says, My brethren, be not many masters. Well, he's talking about uh, the men in the local assemblies that are uh, gifted with the abilities of teaching and preaching that are responsible for teaching in the public assembly. And Paul clearly states in his epistle that it is only men that are to be teaching in the public assembly, in, in uh, a mixed congregation, right? So we see that these pronouns are very important. Paul did not say, my sisters. He said, my brethren. But in Bibles like the NIV, this language is changed to my brothers and sisters. And then it says in verse 2, if anyone offend in word. So you see that that gender inclusive uh, language there is really a corruption of what God said. Because God, uh, do you think God was 
purposeful when he used a masculine or a neuter or a feminine pronoun? Absolutely he was, and it needs to be translated as such. And I understand that there are versions from your modern critical text that, uh, uh, that as of right now, will still uphold those pronouns, and I'm thankful for that. But those modern versions are also subject to impending revision. And so just like we, we, we um, used this statement when we talked about the theology of the text and when we talked about modern textual criticism, we said that the praxis is far worse than the current product. And I think it's the same with translations as well. The process or the praxis is worse than the product. For instance, the New King James Version, it's fine and well as a translation, but my problem with the New King James Version is not what it is, but what it might become. See, Nelson owns the copyright to the New King James Version, and you say, it's a pretty decent translation today, uh, but at some point, a revision will come, and it will. Because Nelson's going to decide, you know what, it's time to revise the New King James Version. It's time to come out with a new revision. It's time to sell some more copies of this Bible. And uh, we need to make a revision. And all of the evidence, if we look at all of the revisions of all of your other versions, all of the evidence points that that uh, revision will be more liberal and less faithful to the original text. And so that's the issue you have with copyrights. So uh, we, would, we would say that the King James ought to be retained because there is no secular copyright on the King James Version. So in conclusion, uh, we understand that the King James uh, should be retained by English-speaking Christians because it is an accurate, historical, and fixed translation of what the apostles and prophets wrote under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And because of the aim and the theology of the King James Version, the translators who worked on it, uh, there is no forthcoming edition of the KJV in the foreseeable future. Uh, there's no liberal revision coming out uh, to the KJV. Even when you have a Bible that calls itself the New King James Version, it, it's a completely separate translation. It's not a revision of this authorized version uh, because the King James is not translated from a textual restorationist framework that says we need to continue revising and improving upon the Word of God, right? So in light of these reasons above here, uh, in the same way that God authenticated the Greek text, which we now call the TR or the Textus Receptus, it is reasonable to understand that God has authenticated the King James Version as the English Bible. This is the English version that God has delivered to His people for the last 400 years, has been predominantly read for the last 300 years. It is a Bible uh, that is fixed. It's monolithic. It's not being constantly changed and revised. It is a Bible that you could use to learn to read the English language. You could read it all your life, and you could live 95 years and die and have it preached at your funeral, and it will be the same Bible. Um, and in light of these reasons, in the providence of God, we see that God has kept His Word pure in all ages. We see that He's faithfully translated His Word into other languages uh, from the perfectly preserved Word of God in the Hebrew and Greek. We had the English revisions that came out with the final copy being there, the King James Version. And so what we hold in our hand is not some willy-nilly uh, Bible that was produced in 1611, but it is the history of God's preserving of His Word. This is the book that William Tyndale died for when he died and said, God opened the eyes of the King of England because he saw the need to have a copy of the Word of God in the English language. And of course, his New Testament would come out and others would come out, but ultimately, the English version that would be used by the people in England would be the King James Version of the Bible. And it is the Bible that has withstood four centuries of scrutiny. It is the Bible that is consistent with providential preservation and the logic of faith. It is the Bible that is still the most read English version today. And as long as the English language exists as we know it, it is the King James Version that should be retained by English speakers. So, pray that this has been a blessing to you. Pray that this has been an encouragement to you. Uh, we will proceed with week 11 next time we meet together as we uh, look at the, the Bible overview section of this course. So, God bless you and thank you.